convention. Uh, I lecture on that subject. I've written books on that subject. Um, it's sort of a passion of mine uh, in that, again, I was in the music business for a while and decided to get out of that because it's really a dead end if any of you are thinking about becoming professional. <laughs> yeah. No cash, no, no glory, no, really nothing. All the things you think about, it's not going to happen. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I, uh, when I decided to do this, I became interested in health care through a health issue that I had. And it came at just a certain point in my life where uh, there are certain points in your life where things change, whether it's age or circumstance or whatever it may be. And that made me want to go in this direction. And I was able to, uh, I was playing more at the time too. And certain things were popping up on my body, right? Pain, discomfort, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I took that and I knew what it was because of the studies I was doing. So I, um, I just started making notes and, and really concentrating in that direction. And, um, and so here I stand before you uh, with this information. Um, I've, uh, I've had a lot of different experiences. So all of the things that you guys talked about, really I have some experience with not only uh, uh, things that I've done or things that I've studied, or things that I have interest in, or uh, I've, I've been on hospital staffs with, uh, with orthopedists and neurologists, so I'm very comfortable with a lot of things in that world. Um, I, I do a lot of personal study on different things, and whether it's uh, meditation or these various techniques that we're talking about, and I understand how that stuff works physiologically, which is super important to me, because it's one thing to talk about acupuncture, and it's one thing to tell you about how it was developed in China and there's these things in the body and energy flows and all that and it doesn't make a lot of sense unless you put it in a proper perspective. So if I can take that and tell you physiologically how it works in the body, something you already know or have an understanding of or can look up easily and make it make sense, then there's more veracity to it and it, makes, it, it gives you more choices as I was talking about earlier when one size does not fit all. Acupuncture might work great for you. You might hate needles. You may be interested in acupuncture. You may think it's a load of nonsense. Um, you may think it's going to go away. And you may all be right in your own way. It depends on your belief systems, uh, how your body responds, etc. There's a lot that goes into it. So I'm here to talk to you today about some common injury presentations. I'm here to talk to you about um, what you can uh, do about them. Uh, I'll tell you uh, the good and the bad about things. I'll tell you the truth as I know it. And that may be like, yeah, you should see a chiropractor or you should never see a chiropractor for that. You should go see a, neuro uh, a neurologist. Oh, you should never take medicine for that. Whatever it may be, I'll, I'll give you my point of view. And when I saw you all interact, I mean, I thought that was really hip because nobody, you're all sort of, thinking about this in real time. And I think that's really the way to go because then you're able to make good decisions about stuff and, and, and have an open mind about it and try it. Say, man, that doesn't work, this tension stuff. And that's totally, it's totally okay. Uh, unless you've been in a car accident and you have to go through specific rehab to get your arm movement back perhaps, then there's really maybe no room for, you know, rubbing coca leaves on it and, and hoping it gets better, right? But in some circumstances, that may work for a particular injury or something like that. So there's different ways to go about different things. And it's good to keep them all in mind. Uh, while we all have our biases, it's certainly good to sort of think about things in a different way. And I hope to do that uh, here um, today. Also, I'm happy to address any of the things that were brought up earlier, um, or I'll take questions at any time. I don't, I don't mind being interrupted uh, if it's something that uh, goes along with what we're talking about, or we can do it later. Um, then I thought we'd have, uh, and this may happen uh, after the break, we'll, we'll kind of see how our time goes. We can go any way we want with this. But I, uh, if a couple of you would like to perform, we can, based on some of the things we talk about here, we can watch you play and maybe point out some things that may help 
uh, well, not changing your playing style, maybe change things posturally. You've talked about posture, you've talked about techniques here over the past several weeks. Let's see somebody play and say, oh man, what if you just straighten your elbow out a little bit? Can you do that? Does that change the way you play? No, not really. Okay, good. If you do that, that won't put tension on this, which won't cause this to tighten up, which won't give you pain in the neck, in the house of Jack built, right? That kind of thing. So um, these things are, again, designed to uh, prevention. Prevention is, is big. Awareness is the biggest part of prevention. If you realize you're doing something that you don't need to do, but you just do it, well then perhaps uh, being aware of that will enable you to stop it or to change it in such a way as to not have to worry about it in future. For example, the whole thing about breathing, I thought it was really uh, interesting uh, the way you were talking about breathing earlier and about um, trying to at certain times increase your breathing or why diaphragmatic breathing would be best um, and capacities and so forth. So breathing overall, diaphragmatic breathing is better simply, and that's my opinion, but I, I believe it to be absolutely true from a variety of perspectives, that when you breathe in more deeply, there is more oxygen being taken in to your lungs. Now, it doesn't mean you can process more oxygen, it means you have the availability to do it, right? When you see people, uh, musicians or athletes, and they go for the, the oxygen on the side, right? right? They're huffing and puffing, and now all of a sudden the blessed oxygen is there, right? There's still only so much being processed. There's only so much you can get into that lung anyway. Okay, but it's how you're going to how you're going to take it in and use it. So if the lungs go essentially from up here down to about here. The diaphragm is here and it goes up and down during breathing. When you breathe in, that's going to expand the lungs. The diaphragm is going to push down to allow for that expansion. Then you're going to breathe out. However, if you only breathe in here, which is considered to be shallow breathing, which is what most people do, that's all you're going to get. It's going to be Right? It's going to be short, clipped breathing, which is what most people do. Um, I tend to breathe, uh, not tend to, I do breathe through my diaphragm. And this was a conscious choice by me. I was, uh, uh, I was in my 20s, I was looking at, I was doing some yoga, and I was doing some sort of self, uh, you know, figuring out what it's all about stuff. And I read that diaphragmatic breathing is best and it was best for these certain things. So, okay, I want to breathe through my diaphragm. It's good for me. All right, well, if you're used to breathing up here, it's hard to just start breathing here. And it's, it seems incredibly um, uh, uh, cumbersome to be turning it on and off, right? I, so I just taught myself to breathe through my diaphragm all the time. And then if I wanted to do a shorter passage or wanted to breathe in, in that way, uh, for some reason I could do it. But I had to have that uh, diaphragmatic breathing available to me all the time. And this is how I did it. It's very simple. Um, it's just rote, okay? Do you think about how you breathe? Do you think about how you walk? Not unless you need to correct it. It's a learned activity. It's habitual. It's already done, right? So I worked when I was going through... Uh, through chiropractic school, one of the few quote-unquote legitimate jobs that I ever had, meaning one that I didn't really want to do, was I worked at this office building and I was like a security guard, right? And I worked from six till six or something like that when there was nobody there and I was able to do uh, work or homework or sleep or whatever I wanted to do, right? But there was this counter that was like this big, this big marble counter. And I thought, well, I want to learn how to breathe through my diaphragm. So I pressed up my diaphragm against the counter. And I leaned there, and I just pushed, not even with my body, I just breathing in and out. I let my abdomen go back and forth like that. And after a couple hours of doing that, it became natural. I've never had to think about it again. So perhaps if diaphragmatic breathing is your goal or to be able to access that sometimes you need to change the way your body is processing it just like we're going to talk about changing the way you do certain things to maybe avoid tendonitis or something like that today right if you do that 
it will become learned behavior. You'll be able to do it all the time, and then you don't have to worry about it or think about it. So that's kind of a cool thing. And that's just the way I did it. It was just practically, how can I solve this problem? Just wrote, just doing it over and over. Anyway, so um, is, who's, is everybody a musician? Oh, yeah. Okay. And we got bass, right? And uh, flute and other wind instruments? Flutes. Flutes. Oh, right. <laughs> Did you get okay. clarinet, Felipe? Yeah, yeah, clarinet here. And you, cornet? Clarinet. Clarinet, okay, okay. Uh, sir? Piano. Piano, okay, cool. And, okay, great. So, uh, again, I thought as we go on here, if any of you want to perform, we can uh, watch you play and, and make suggestions, or you can look and see, hey, what, did, what could that person maybe be doing a little bit differently, sort of, uh, empower you to recognize this stuff as we go, okay? So um, this is your time too. If you want to bring something up, please feel free and uh, we'll, we'll address it in real time as we go. All right. There we go. Okay, so postural awareness. We're starting out with posture or why do we care, right? Posture, it's, it's interesting because that's one of those things that you may, as a young person, be told about and forced into, right? Sit up straight, do, the, do it this way, right? And you're never told why. You're just told by somebody with a scowl on their face, and you naturally sort of don't want to do it. And it may be uncomfortable at the time. Sitting up straight doesn't feel as good as sort of kicking back on your side once in a while. That's naturally uh, how we feel, like we want to rest or we want to relax or something like that. Uh, but these things become learned behavior. So tightness on one side of the body or in one area of the body um, may become chronic problem and usually we notice that by what? Pain, right? Do we care about any of this stuff in general? We care about it when it hinders our ability to move around, our ability to play, our ability to sleep our ability to do something we want to do because we have pain, all right? Something's wrong. We've got to fix it. We have to take care of it. So that's why we generally care about these things is pain is the generator and the reason for that. Otherwise, we're just all sitting around. We might as well just have coffee and talk about other stuff, right? It's about taking care of these issues and these pains. So what we see is there's uh, the way to break this down that I see is standing or sitting and you're going to be doing both in performing and practicing situations. Um, I think it's good to be uniform in performing and practicing situations, how you're going to uh, approach and hold your instrument, rather than, oh, well, I'm going to play now, so I'm really going to be good, or I'm really going to have my, my, uh, my practice together or my, uh, my posture together, whereas if I'm just practicing at home, I can just kick back and it's going to be cool and who cares, right? That learned behavior, again, translates from standing to sitting to doing this over and over again. So if you do things, uh, quote unquote, correctly or more efficiently, shall we say, it's going to be more advantageous to you in the long run because then you don't have to think about how or learn how to undo something. You already are doing it in a way where you can, um, you, you are, making it so that it's not going to be a problem. Or you can correct it on the fly, your awareness of your body. We talked about that tension relaxation, um, or we talked about also just focus and visualization and relaxation techniques. This being just having an awareness of basic anatomy or of certain things and being able to relax them in that way as you go. So you may be playing and you may notice, wow, my hand is really tight. Maybe it doesn't need to be that tight. And then you finish a passage and shake it out and you go back with maybe less of a heavy hand and you're still able to play the stuff. You just don't have that death grip, right? And that death grip may come from oh, uh, the performance anxiety, right? You're out there, you're gonna play now, right? And you get all tense because you are you're have some anxiety about that perhaps. Yes, sir. Well, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Shin Lin, who was a professor of cell biology, talked to us about that by mentally becoming, by, by mentally uh, imaging physical strength, you could get 60% of the physical benefits of actually doing something physical. Talk about strengthening, particular muscle mm -hmm. strengthening. Mm -hmm. 
I wonder how if that same principle works in terms of relaxation. If you met, reflecting what we were talking about earlier, if you mentally scan and imagine the relaxation without doing the progressive part of it, mm -hmm. can you get? Does it work in that direction as well? Again, oh, okay. so it would intuitively that makes sense. It would, you know. Again, if you give your if you give your body the the right messages, it, you know. And again, again, it, I guess it's the, the awareness part. If we have a, a clear idea of what the right message is, then it should work. What do you guys think? Well, isn't that the visualization that they talk about in the book? Well, it, yeah, in part, that, that's it, exactly. But, you know, it, 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 well, I keep thinking about, well, we can, without having studied anatomy, can we visualize correctly? Oh, bodies. Yeah. Right. That, that's what I'm, that, that, you know, so mm -hmm. th this is a question I've been asking when we talked about about this. Can we do this course comprehensively without having a real understanding of anatomy? And I'm sure we can to a point, but there's a point where anyone who gets deeper to it starts studying anatomy. Yeah, I think I think you're doing that, that now. Uh, this, the anatomy here isn't going to be all that specific in that it's going to be talking about certain places and certain things, but I'm not going to be saying the Terry's minor muscle goes here because nobody cares about that. It's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's something that's just going to sort of clog up the lines of understanding if you don't know what that is because it's not necessary. Because like if, like if you are going to play a passage for me and I don't know about music and you say, oh, well, when I ostinato, I'm not going to know what that is. Perhaps uh, if you go see a doctor and tell them that they might not know what that is if you're trying to get better on something. So if you play in it that way, then they'll, oh, okay, right. Well, I see your hands moving more quickly or something like that. So as I see it, this is all a survey course and and you can take this further if you need yeah. to but if you start out w with the idea of anatomy in mind um, then you can focus on that directly this seems to be general relaxation so I could say to that yeah for some people the best thing to be is going to go off by themselves before they play for a few minutes turn the lights out and try some breathing and just relax and take yourself away from this pressure that you're putting yourself under for this performance that's coming up, right? So that's certainly one way to do it. And if you can do it in the whole body, yeah, why screw around with one finger at a time, right? Why do more work than you have to do or that you want to do, right? Work smarter, not harder. So if you can find a relaxation technique and that's what you need and that's going to take care of everything at once, fantastic, right? I'm going to talk about uh, something in the next slide or two that I uh, use as a general approach. I call it a reference posture. posture sure rather uh, and that is something that is a general approach to anything and it could be an approach to farming I mean it's not unique to this it's about just being able to relax and to uh, put yourself in that place so yeah cool um, so standing what we normally do is if we're gonna, uh, and this would apply I'm coming I'm looking at it from a basis perspective uh, electric or upright but any instrument will do. I mean, any instrument that you're going to have a strap or you're going to have to stand once in a while, that kind of thing, we lean, right? With this particular instrument, basis, upright basis, are notoriously, they'll pick it up, and depending on how they hold it, if they hold it with their side facing them or more on the back, uh, even if they hold it in such a way as it's balanced, pretty well on their abdomen, generally they know they're going to be there for a while, they're going to be playing, so they set up and they do the lean, right? And they get into this place where they are leaning on the right hand side. Well, after hours and years of doing that, it becomes a learned behavior, right? Even as I'm speaking to you, I am moving around from side to side uh, as I do this. I'm not leaning on one side, but that's what my body tells me to do because I can stand up there and talk to you for several minutes, but then I'm going to get kind of tired of it, right? Especially if it's something I don't want to do. If I work at a counter at a job all day, first thing I'm going to do is try to get into what I think is a more relaxing position, which is really just making everything 
curve one way, like the spine, etc., etc., making the hips sort of slant upward, and the muscles around there are going to tighten to compensate for this. That it's going to become learned behavior, not only because this is going to tighten up and be reinforced by your standing that way all the time, but you're going to naturally go to that as your go-to position when you play. You're going to go and you're going to lean and you're going to stay like that. My thing is, if you're doing that, if you're leaning, you it, and, and you can't change the way you play. I mean, you're like, man, if I play, I just can't play like this. I got to do my lean. That's my thing. And the guys been playing for 20 years. Maybe they don't want to change, and maybe they're not gonna change. If you can just say, all right. You don't have to not lean when you play, but when you're not playing, when the drummer's playing and you're laying out, can you not just stand up straight that, at that point in time, right? Can you not do that for 30 seconds to break that cycle or a minute or whatever it is? Yeah, I can do that. That's not going to change anything. And then go back and play like that. If you can't or aren't willing to change this pattern that may be causing you a problem, then you can go there when you're not in service to the instrument or to the music. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah, it's just about awareness of that, that you can do that. And some people are like, I'm not going to change that. I can't change that. I don't want to change that. Okay, take a breath, you know. Just straighten out for a minute. Can you do that? That will break these sort of patterns that we have, okay? Slouching, again, that's the same thing. And this deals with a lot more things like regular jobs, like uh, computers, everything else, right? We're all sitting at times, and if we have to sit for long periods of time, we want to get more comfortable, or what we think is more comfortable, putting our body in these sort of uh, oblong ways and, and in these ways that we think is more comfortable, or our couches, right? Does anybody go home and watch TV sitting on the kitchen chair? No, you get this big... Uh, this big sort of soft fluffy couch or something with deep cushions where yeah, the best is if you uh, the best kind of couch to get right is the one where you well not where you, where you sit and like your legs are this high because it's so deep right that's what we want but that's comfort well that's bad news but that's what we want to do um, again if you're not going to be if you're not willing to get rid of that couch or sit on that uncomfortable kitchen chair, um, there has to be some kind of a give and take. With sitting, there's ways to practice when you're sitting too. Um, for guitar players, every guitar player really sits like this. Classical guitar playing position, you put your foot up on a pedal, you put the guitar here, and then you don't have to really worry about having access to the instrument. It's right here. But everybody puts the guitar here and has to turn this way, right? And they have to look down and they have to turn their body and their neck and this causes muscles to tighten up and discomfort. So there's ways to do this that can, uh, that can uh, if you're aware of them, you can do them in a little different way so you don't uh, so you don't get these problems. So leaning, slouching, accommodating the instrument or situation. If I'm going to play uh, the bass and I'm going to go get the bass, right, um, I'm probably maybe going to go bend like that and just sort of pick it up at an oblong angle or try to get it into my car. That's always a good one, right? <laughs> or trying to move it around in a certain way or the way that I carry it or... There's ways to carry this instrument that make sense uh, from an ergonomic point of view and from a postural point of view where you don't have to hurt yourself with that, okay? It's about uh, the approach to the instrument. If I bend at my knees, I'm able to get up close to the instrument. Now, accommodating the instrument, maybe um, I do this and I bend down okay, but then I go and I pick it up. Like this one, it's okay if I do this yeah, right. Okay. So I like, lift it like this, and then that's just going to strain my back anyway. So what I just did is pointless. you got to get close to it and like bring it to you, and then lift it in such a way as that's going to uh, help to take that strain off of, say, the low back. Okay, And the way that you hold it, too, is, uh, is going to be important. So if I'm playing like this, 
Well, that may work. I'm playing with the red on the side there, right? That may work okay, but what happens when I have to go here? Am I not going to have to curve my hand excessively to reach around? I'm going to play on the E up here, right? Or am I not going to have to turn my body in certain ways where this is going to be uh, cumbersome, going to be a problem? Or if I play more flat like that, am I not going to have to do that too? So maybe I balance it like this, and then the bowing is a whole other matter. But I'm just saying that there's approaches and there's ways that you can look at this that make it, uh, and to any instrument, that make it more advantageous uh, than others. So I'm going to try to put this down in a way now that practice what you preach, right? So there are ways standing and sitting to do things. I prefer, like if I'm, if I'm going to play guitar, I would have the strap on the instrument all the time. Because if I'm going to perform in that way, then I don't want to set my body up in such a way where I'm going to play like that. And then when I practice at home, it's completely off and completely different. So when I do go to play live and perform, it doesn't come off as a separate thing or it's a different thing. So far, so good? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, jump in any time or not as you choose. Uh, so sitting slouching, the chair is important too. Uh, the chairs for orchestras I think are getting better. Do you play with orchestras a lot, Mark? Uh, not so much, but uh, okay. I have in the past. You guys play with orchestras or big ensembles? Are the chairs any better? Uh, I, don't sure. know. I don't know if you have a comparison. Are the chairs yeah, like this so or are they... Yeah, they're too horrible. Yeah, because traditionally, even for like major orchestras, the chairs were horrible, right? And that combined with one music stand for three musicians, that's always a good one too, right? So uh, these things seem to be changing a little. I see a lot of ergonomic chairs out there. I just don't know if people are buying them for orchestras, all right? You may have to buy your own chair, these ergonomic chairs. And all they're doing is just giving you more of a base of support for your body so you're not in some chair that may be off a little bit that may be a little rickety or that may not suit you right we're we're different sizes and and one size does not fit all again like we talked about before so your comfort may not be mine right as far as this angle and that's going to affect the way you sit in your back and the way that you try to accommodate the instrument maybe because of this crappy chair right uh, the same thing with the couches like we were talking about before so sometimes you can control that sometimes you can't if you're at home you can control it you get the chair that you want if you have to go play the same way with the same group every day and, and you do what you can then you have to figure out something that's going to uh, allow you to uh, sit in such a way that you're not uh, having to put yourself out of whack to accommodate that instrument and then play a different way another time. So positioning is very important. The most advantageous way to approach the instrument in particular, just uh, so that you're, again, not playing in such a way that maybe your wrists are going to be bent like that, or your back is going to be bent like that, or your neck, or anything like that, or anything that is going to develop in a long, to a long-term chronic problem, which is going to turn into pain. And by that time, it may be uh, a little late to change it. You're going to have to go see somebody about it, right? They're going to have to, you have to go through some therapy. Or they're going to say, oh, you, you can't play for a while or something like that, right? That's one of the favorite things of the, the doctor, right? Oh, well, it hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. You know, well, I'm a musician. Okay, well, don't play for three months. Or, um, you know what, you might have to give up the instrument or something like that. That's sometimes what you're going to hear doesn't mean that that's the case at all. You can turn this stuff around. But again, it depends on the circumstance. And we're going to talk about a few of those things coming up in just a minute. Again, practicing, I prefer to uh, practice the same way as I'm going to perform, whether sitting or standing. Uh, common challenges, our environment, again, the chairs, chair, chair again, unfamiliar instrument, maybe you're, if you're a drummer or a pianist, uh, maybe the uh, instruments are different, the action's different, whatever it may be, what you're going to be playing on, even with the bass sometimes. Uh, 
this is one thing that uh, can come into it. Stage anxiety, well, we touched on that with the breathing and things like that. There's techniques to help with that. Some of them were touched on in that book. You should try them all and see what works and what doesn't. You may find that that tension relaxation doesn't work at all, but you may find that visualization of an area, one area at a time, does work. Or again, just you may find that going off by yourself for a few minutes in a dark room makes you relax totally, and then you can go out and play and not get all psyched up about this kind of thing, and that helps. All of this turns into habitual behavior eventually. We don't think about it anymore. We just go do it. It becomes this conscious, unconscious thing, right? This thing where you just perform an action and you just do something, like we talked about breathing or like we talked about walking. You don't think left foot forward, right foot forward, unless you have to change that for some reason. Or you need to relearn that activity. You don't think about breathing in now, breathing out now. You just do that over time. Well, that is something that unconsciously becomes part of us, and so do these things, and that's why we care about this postural awareness. If I go lean like that all the time, that's going to be the way I do that, and that's just going to be a natural reaction, and that could cause problems that may uh, take a while to uh, get rid of if you're not aware of them, or if you don't have a way to sort of break them up uh, rather than just always going and sitting there, like I said, just kind of straightening out once in a while if you're able to. So these are common challenges we may face, plus just not knowing about this stuff. Who teaches you about postural awareness ever, right? Did you all start when you were young in, in grammar school, I would say, for the most part, or playing? Yeah? Did anybody ever talk to you about, besides... You need to curl your hand to play like this, or what he's, besides generally navigating the instrument, did anybody ever talk to you about how to not tense up, or how to stand, or how to not stand, or how to sit, how to approach the instrument with any regard whatsoever for you besides the instrument? Anybody? No, it just doesn't happen, right? It just doesn't happen. I had a nun who taught me how to play piano. I don't know, do nuns still beat you up in school? They did when I went to school, right? They would give you a, a crack if you weren't sitting up straight. That's how I learned to sit up straight, and that's why I hated it, which is ironic that I'm here now talking to you about it. Who knew, right? Uh, so, these are some of the things that we talk about. Um, and just let me know time-wise what we need to do or not do. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're good for you. Okay. Uh, so, reference, posture, and approach. So this is something that you can do just by thinking about uh, a couple of things before you're going to approach the instrument that may make a lot of these problems go away. I talked about the uh, propensity to lean on one side or the other. Um, you want to generally balance yourself evenly on both feet. It's thought that uh, about uh, hip width apart is right, but it may be different for different people depending on your stature. What I think about when I'm going to think about my posture, and I'm changing this a little bit, you saw the uh, Alexander technique, uh, uh, technique with uh, Eileen, uh, what, a couple weeks ago, right? So you probably remember some of that. So there's a lot of similarities between what I think about as posture and what that is. Simply, it's about just keeping your head up for one thing and your shoulders relaxed. That goes a long way towards solving a lot of these problems. So there's something called a plumb line. Does anybody know what a plumb line is? Mm -hmm. Okay. So a plumb line is simply a string. It could be a string or it's a line that comes down from a point high up, and it is there to measure, uh, in this case, posture. So you look for this line to fall straight down on certain anatomical landmarks. So it goes from the top of your head, through your earlobe, through your shoulder, down through your hip, uh, just behind the knee, just in front of the ankle. But what we're talking about here essentially is going to be up to, oh, maybe the elbow. And what I do is I look at this as something that I'm going to do before I start to play, instead of just picking up the bass and tuning up and setting up and figuring out how I'm going to do it, I go and I look at, I, I 
do a survey of myself first. And this can be uh, brought into your everyday life very easily. It's simply, if you pretend you have a string attached to the top of your head, like you're a puppet, which we all are at certain times, um, and that is pulling you up to the ceiling or the sky or heaven or whatever you know, makes you happy, if that is pulling you up, that's going to bring your head into a place where it's going to sort of align yourself with your spine and the rest of your body. And the reason that's important is because most people walk around kind of like that first one. And it looks silly when placed next to the, uh, the model of the uh, so-called good posture, but a lot of people kind of stand like this and we probably don't think about it until you think about the fact that in really good posture, this bottom of the earlobe should be lined up with the shoulder here, like it is here, and like it is not here. Watch people, watch people at school, watch people walking down the street. Most people will walk like this because the head leads uh, and people like to slouch when they're in their so-called relaxation time or to be comfortable. So there's a natural forward head posture that a lot of people adopt, okay? Now, if I do this straightening out thing, like I think about that string, which is an easy thing to remember, I think, uh, and which, again, when practiced, will enable you to go to that place more often than not. When that head comes up, you talked before about the voice changing uh, due to the physiology. Well, that's going to happen right now if I just straighten out the, uh, the, uh, the body. You're going to feel, you're going to hear my voice become more clear, and I'm going to stand in a way that is more conducive to the rest of my body relaxing, and my shoulders aren't going to be as tense, too. Everybody's shoulders, people walk around like this. If you tell, if you remember to take a breath and drop the shoulders, like a deep breath in and it, it, to exaggerate it, you can try to bring the shoulders up like you're trying to touch your ears and then blow that air out, exhale and drop those shoulders. You'll notice you probably drop those shoulders two, three inches from where they were before, or where they are most of the time. That's because people are walking around like this all the time and it becomes learned behavior. The muscles tighten up as does this, and this is normal for most people. If you're able to think about the string pulling you up and bring your shoulders up and drop them like that, that really frees the muscles in the area and enables you to uh, go ahead and be able to play your instrument in such a way as you don't have to worry about that starting from that place where things are already tight or tense or out of whack as it is. You can just let that out and you're going to be more free and more relaxed and then uh, you're able to sort of concentrate on the playing more. Yeah? Pretty, pretty straightforward stuff? Yeah? Okay. So uh, I like that idea of the, I, I think about the string and I think about the earlobe lining up with the shoulder and that seems to work uh, for me very well and for most people as well. Uh, so common injury presentations for musicians and others. This is the stuff that I see most in my practice. Um, and I see musicians every day, all day, at, at all levels, at all levels. Um, so for musicians and others, tendonitis, that's the one we all know about, right? Repetitive stress injuries, there's a lot of different ways to call it, but that's essentially what it is. So a tendon attaches a muscle to a bone, all right? So if I go like that, that guy, that's a tendon, right? And that's going to attach muscles in my arms to bones in my hand. So if I'm playing in such a way as this is overused or tightened, this muscle is gonna pull on that tendon, which will pull on a bone, let's say in the hand in this case. There's many bones in the hand which articulate independently, but when they're overused and they tighten up, they pull in such a way so those bones don't articulate individual anymore. What they do is they all kind of tighten up as one and then you get pain maybe here, maybe here, okay? Uh, you get pain and you just kind of keep going and it gets worse. That's what tendonitis usually is. You'll see that commonly uh, at the wrist, you'll see it at the elbow, the shoulder's a big one too, okay, like right here, there's a tendon that can also be a bursitis, which is the next thing. Um, it doesn't really matter as far as treatment because the treatment is the same, but tendonitis 
is repetitive motion over and over and over again. So there's different treatment methods for that if you went and saw a physical therapist or maybe a chiropractor who did physical therapy stuff or something of that nature, they would do something to try to reduce the inflammation. When you overdo something over and over again, it's going to become inflamed, it's going to become painful. So you can do something to help reduce that inflammation. Some people will take some Motrin. Uh, that might work if it's uh, a newer type of injury. If you let it go over and over and over again, it's gonna become chronic and become a problem and then need more attention. Ultrasound is a good one. Ultrasound is a modality which goes down deeply, helps to relax the area and reduce the inflammation, uh, ways to relax the muscles. There's many of them. Massage is one. Uh, electric stem is another. That's a modality that actually works to tighten and relax the muscles like we talked about earlier. So there's a therapeutic way to do that too. The idea, the idea being if the muscle is already tight, if you put this machine on there that has pads that send a current in there that makes your muscles tighten and relax, it forces the muscle to relax, thereby becoming a learned behavior and the muscle relaxes and you go about your business. A cortisone shot. Now, I don't uh, think that's the best thing to do right off the bat, but sometimes it's necessary. It's a steroid, okay? Do you want a steroid in your body? I don't, but if nothing else is working and there's some kind of a minor injury, like a minor tear or something that's not gonna fix itself on its own, that might be the way to go. Or other stuff may not work. Like I said, one side, uh, excuse me, one size does not fit all, so maybe the cortisone shot is what you need. Um, the problem with that is if you get the shot and you feel better, you go ahead and you do the same thing over again, right? Now you've got a sense that everything is fine and the problem doesn't go away and could perhaps get worse. Uh, repetitive stress, again, just doing things over and over and over again. So if you're able to uh, relax, you're able to take little breaks, uh, maybe if you're performing and these muscles are always tight, rather than maybe keeping your uh, wrist bent or your hand situated in the instrument in such a way as that muscle is going to stay tight or you stay at the ready for that next particular passage that's coming, even for the minute in between when you're not playing, what if you, instead of, okay, my part's coming up now, or I'm ready, or yeah, I think I'm relaxing, what if you just kind of shook it out Okay, and that will sort of take the attention of the body on that area as being tight away. It'll disrupt that constant uh, tension you're putting it under, and there won't be that problem anymore. Okay, make sense? And it's easily done. I, this isn't complicated to do. You just kind of shake it out, or you just don't keep it in that position that you were keeping it in. We'll talk about taking breaks and something uh, in a little bit as well. So bursitis, a bursa can be uh, under a tendon. A bursa is something that uh, you'll see in various areas of the body here very commonly, uh, the knee, the hip very commonly. What happens is, fix this. If it doesn't work, there's the cortisone shot, which yeah. is going to reduce the inflammation. If that doesn't work, the last stop is the surgery. Mm -hmm. After these proper ways to fix this have been tried, and then that surgery, even if you have to do that, it's, not, yeah. it's pretty hip. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest you go do it right away because you don't want to do that if you don't have to, but it's really not that bad. They move it over here and problem solve. Mm -hmm. But that's what I would, and if you want, I'll give you my information. You can email me later and I'll, I'll let you know what all this stuff is. But that's what you should seek out to try to fix this specifically. And I've treated this hundreds, if not thousands of times, and it usually goes just fine. Okay. Okay? Cool. Thank you. Okay, well, yeah. Let's Ready? See. Yeah, sure. Okay. Good. Uh, okay, so we're going to see some people play in uh, a couple minutes. Um, any two or three people want to play? Does that, does that work out? And, for everybody, and we'll sort of analyze it. Did you, okay, what was your question, sir? Or did you have one? No, I mean, go ahead. I'm, I'm thinking. Like, okay, okay. Everybody cool so far? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. this stuff is interesting, sometimes it's dry, sometimes yeah. it's both. You're getting both. Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, so that's carpal tunnel, right? There's ways to fix carpal tunnel, but it should be diagnosed properly, not just it's coming from the wrist, it's carpal tunnel, go for therapy, get out of my office. 
do 50 of these every day, right? Like we just talked about. I was talking to this gentleman about the therapy that he had for this condition. The problem is, is that if the therapist is not hip to this kind of thing, they will give you some stock exercises for pain in the arm or whatever. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, you're out of luck, all right? What I like to do, and what I would encourage you all to do, is if you have a performance-related injury, and you're going to go see somebody about it, tell them, don't ask them, tell them, okay, that's great, by the way, I'm bringing my instrument with me because I want to show the doctor what I'm doing so maybe this can be figured out. If they don't want to, because they don't want to give you the time, or they don't want because a lot of doctors don't touch you, right? They just kind of, yeah, it's this, take three of these, right? Okay, that, that happens. If they don't want to take the time, doctor, physical therapist, whatever, to watch you perform and try to figure out what this thing is and how to change it, then they're not interested in helping you, frankly. And it may work, it may not. And if it doesn't, who cares? They got your insurance card or your $200 a visit or whatever it is, right? So um, I would do that. And I would say, well, I really need for this person to see what I'm doing and help to figure this out. If you can, I'm going to go somewhere else. And they may say, good, adios. Or they may say, okay, hold on. And, oh, yeah, Dr. Jones is familiar with this. Or, yeah, you can see, you know, Raj or whatever it may be, right? So this is something I would encourage you to do. And I wouldn't settle for less because you think there's a shortage of doctors or physical <laughs> therapists or chiropractors out there. Believe me, there ain't, okay? Um, I can help you find somebody, too, if push comes to shove. But whatever. I'll give you my information later. Anyway, so that I would always... Now, you're not going to be bringing a piano to your doctor's office. I understand that. But there's got to be a way to demonstrate that motion for them or to find somebody. I bet if you did a little looking around, even surfing the net, you'd be able to find somebody maybe who deals with this particular injuries or with penis. Or call up a piano teacher. Call, ask one of your colleagues, hey, man, anybody ever had this problem? It's, you know, the information's got to be out there. So... You know, go for it a little bit, okay? okay. Uh, low back pain, or sciatica, or disc syndromes, or pinched nerve, or piriformis syndrome. Um, just as people love to say anything coming from the wrist is carpal tunnel, they love to say any pain that's going into the lower extremities coming from the low back. Sometimes that's the case, sometimes it's not. Sciatica is the sciatic nerve which goes down the leg and usually if it goes up to about the knee, it's coming from a joint called the sacroiliac joint. Uh, that usually tightens up from muscles around it becoming tight from maybe slouching, maybe uh, picking up an instrument wrong, maybe sleeping wrong, maybe learned behavior over a period of time. That's usually how it is. People get into certain positions, they keep doing them, the joint tightens up. This is the joint that is responsible for you walking. So you've got uh, the sacrum, which is the lowest part of the back, and you've got the hip here. When you move, this is the movement that occurs when you move your leg. So if you move your leg and there's pain, that joint is usually restricted. It presses down on that nerve, goes down the leg, there's your sciatica, okay? That can be caused by a disc, which uh, goes uh, between the bones or vertebrae of the back. Sometimes those are... Uh, pushed out of place, again, a lot of times by tight muscles pulling on those areas. That causes a pinched nerve, which in this case could be sciatica. Piriformis syndrome is one of the most overlooked things, and I'm going to mention this to you because it might save you a little hassle down the road. When you have sciatica or pain going down your leg and you go see somebody and they say, oh, you got a this problem, or you got a this problem, or you got a that problem without even touching you, right? If the pain is in your butt, which sometimes it's not in the low back at all. If it's in the butt, there's a muscle that goes across the back of the butt from here to here. It's called the piriformis muscle. The sciatic nerve goes behind sometimes through that muscle. And think about it, right? Dudes, wallets, back pockets, sitting, right? You sit on there. Pressure on that muscle presses on that nerve. Pain, discomfort it has nothing to do with the low back. Maybe if someone gets lucky, they'll treat the low back and that'll take care of that muscle. But 
without directly working on that or diagnosing it properly, it's not going to get fixed. So if the pain is in the butt, and you know it's in the butt, okay, then it's probably that piriformis syndrome. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Okay. <laughs> so look at this intent, this intent musician here, right? Doing what he's supposed to do, playing his music, all oh, it's good, right? So if you look at that picture, does that look like uh, any, any, any musician um, really getting into it, really delivering some solid music? Or are there some things there, based on what we talked about, or based on observations you may, uh, you may make, that are probably not good? Anybody see anything in there that, uh, that looks like it could cause trouble in the short or the long term? Well, the bass is away from his body, so when he stands up, it's not going to be in the same spot. Okay, that's for sure, right? You can see so that's a, that's actually a little uh, you can see a little slack in there, right? So yeah, that's not gonna that that could be a problem too, certainly. Um, anything else? The wrist on the right hand. Okay, what what about it? It's bent. It's bent at a crazy angle, right? right? And it's not even I didn't even do this, which is again what a lot of bassists love to do too. So yeah, that's bent at an angle where that can cause a carpal tunnel or similar like syndrome because that the carpal tunnel is simply bones of the hand. There's a nerve and many structures that go through this narrow area and from overuse or from having the hand in an exaggerated posture like that, that causes that to become uh, already crowded area, inflamed and painful, and then you get that carpal tunnel or similar type of syndrome. What also you may not be able to see here so much that's really causing that angle is bassists love to anchor on the pickup which increases that angle, and also they love to rest their forearm on the edge of the instrument, all of this making this even worse. So there's like three things in this one thing that are going to cause problems for this young player uh, uh, at some point in his life, so he might have to go and get another gig, like maybe become a doctor or something. <laughs> um, anything else? Neck? Yeah, right? Yeah, I look like I'm really getting something yeah. there, right? Yeah, I'm getting a pain in the neck is what I'm getting because that's really bad. Again, the voice thing again, right? The voice completely changes. Everything's tightening up and being constricted. And I'm probably bopping, which doesn't make it any better. That's going to go to make these muscles tight and constricted and cause all these problems that we've been talking about all along. So, yeah, absolutely uh, right on all counts. Uh, let's see. So, okay, mind, mind, muscle, uh, memory, visualization. So I've got a couple more slides here, which I could really talk about forever if I so choose. Are you guys more interested in getting this information or watching somebody play as many people as possible in real time? Is well, some of these topics, like on this, you know, we cover, we've covered in the reading. Okay. So I mean, I. So I'll, I'll shoot what, through what, these, right? What, it's really, what, what, what would you prefer? I would like to hear it. Okay. Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll shoot through this, and we yeah. can always come back if we need to. Um, it's just, I just, I need to know how many personal anecdotes to insert. It's for, for time purposes, <laughs> oh. right? Okay. So visualization, you've talked about that. We talked about that. Focus, we, I even had a little aside over there where I talked about focus. We have about 35 minutes, so. Okay, cool. We'll be, we'll, if we watch two or three people play, that'll, that'll be about 20 minutes of time. Right. So we're in good shape. Good. Um, isolation, again, we talked about the tension, relaxation, or just the visualization. Focus on that area. Um, if you want to relax your hand, you may want to focus just on that. Uh, or do you want to get a whole body sort of relaxation? Then that goes into a whole other thing. But if you can focus on that hand and relax it, maybe through tension, uh, maybe not. I personally wouldn't do the tension. I, I don't think it's necessary, but it may be for you just to foster awareness of what tension and relaxation really is. That's useful. That's being hip to your body, that's awareness of this, and then being able to just, man, my hand is tight. And instead of going through an elaborate relaxation procedure, just, okay, you know, just automatically loosening up that 
area and any other area that may cause problems as we go down the line. Um, mental practice. So this means you talked earlier about playing seven, eight hours a day, right? And a lot of people do that and they think they're going to get better and they think I work longer and harder than the other person. I'm going to get ahead and I'm going to be a better musician, okay? Well, to some extent, yeah, you got to pay your dues, but some of the greatest musicians of all time did this mental practice where, man, you can, if you know your fingerboard, you can see it. I can figure out a song on the drive over here, right? If I know what I'm doing, so the dexterity, I may just, I may run scales in a very haphazard manner in front of the TV um, just to keep my fluidity up, right? But that doesn't mean I need to play these things with a, a metronome and keep increasing them and, and, and doing all these particular exercises designed to increase strength and endurance and all that. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I'm saying that that's not for everybody, right? It's not the way to go for everybody. Uh, you may need that, okay, then go do it. And it may not cause any problems. Okay, fantastic. But you can practice without doing that. I've got a guy right now, as a matter of fact, in six, so in 16 years of practice, I'm a chiropractor. Part of the reason I became a chiropractor is because I didn't want people dying on me, frankly. You know what I mean? If somebody's back hurts, I will feel bad for them, but I'll see you tomorrow. You know what I mean? It'll probably be okay. I don't want to form a relationship with Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Jones gets cancer and I have to tell her and then she dies and, and then I either have to, to go through that over and over again, which takes a toll on me personally, or I become immune to it and I lose that empathetic part of myself. Neither one of those appeals to me, right? I'd rather take care of your back pain or your arm pain or whatever and be the hero, right? It's fantastic. So the mental practice comes in got a guy right now, I think maybe three or four times in 16 years, I've actually saved somebody's life. I, it is usually by what I didn't do rather than what I did do. So I've known this guy for a long, long, long time, and he's a really good guitar player. He's like a shredder, right? He played, you know, blah, 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 all that, you know, the neoclassical stuff and 80 miles an hour and all the rest of that stuff, which is cool if that's what, you, you know, if that's what moves you, fantastic. So he came into my office, and he was just not right. I mean, he just didn't look right. What he told me his pain was seemed very straightforward and very simple. But he just was not looking right. He was very anxious. But it wasn't just an anxiety that was there just because he was worried about what was happening. I mean, he was in some obvious distress. His blood pressure wasn't even particularly high. So it was kind of a judgment call. But he just didn't look right to me. So I sent him to the emergency room. And it was an ordeal because he had to call a cab. He doesn't have a lot of money, you know, probably crappy insurance. So this was, this is a decision that I don't take lightly because I don't want to put anybody in a bad way for a head cold, you know what I mean? Or for, or for something that's not going to be a big issue. So in the emergency room, I just heard from him a couple days ago. His mom called me. He's been in the hospital in the ICU for two months. Oh my they found an abscess in his spine. Abscess, big gaping infected hole, right? So he uh, had to go through the, the surgeries and then, which happens a lot in hospital, sepsis, infection right. of the blood set in, and, and he just has been in incredible, uh, incredibly touch and go situation. Out of 60 days in the hospital, he was in the ICU for 30 of them, okay? And he's had to have all these setbacks. And now he's got bed sores. He's a young guy. He's in his 30s, right? He's got bed sores. And he has to learn how to move again because his muscles have atrophied from non-use, right? So now he's calling me and he's, he wants to play his guitar. I'm like, man, you play your guitar, right? And he is telling me that they're saying, well, we don't know if you're going to be able to move your hand again and, 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 and give him all this sort of dreary news. And I go, man, tell me about this. And I said, you know, that doesn't sound like there's a problem with communication from the nerves to that area. That doesn't sound like where the problem is. If the problem's down here, that's going to affect nerves going down here. It's not going to affect nerves up here. It's, a, it's just a different thing okay it's just a different area different set of nerves so 
my point is, going back to mental practice, I told him, he said, man, I can't play, I can't move my fingers, I'm feeling down. I said, okay, take a, break, take a deep breath, and all those scales and all that stuff you're going to practice, practice anyway, right? Hold the guitar in your hand, go through all that stuff in your head, because there are neural connections which not only physically, meaning the, the nerve sensation traveling, my mind says, uh, I want to move this desk because it's in my way. Okay, that sort of action step right there, that communication between the mind and the muscles necessary to do that in real time. There is also areas of the mind, of the brain in particular, that are designated to do certain activities whether they're visceral activities, organs, or whether they're physical activities uh, like that. So my point is, is that from not using these muscles, they became atrophied. And by keeping in your head those patterns, when you come time to translate that physically into muscle memory, once again, those scales that you can do uh, in your sleep, as it were, um, you'll be able to do that more quickly by keeping that part sharp. So you, you had talked earlier about mind-muscle or muscle-to-mind, unless we're talking about a certain pathology uh, in particular that one has to recover from, like say this. Um, it's all the same thing. One serves the other, and at some point it becomes, unless there's a pathology, who cares? Chicken, egg, you know, yeah, yeah. get it all together, right? And make it work seamlessly and not have this division, right? Okay, so um, that just happened, so that was an interesting thing. So phantom limb pain, um, that's, that's something that's a, a really cool anecdote, but it just sort of correlates what I just talked about um, with this mental practice and keeping the mind sharp and that connection between physical and mental activity. So I'm probably not going to go into that uh, unless we had a couple minutes. That's something I sort of geek out on anyway. Uh, take a break and a breath. So I have had wonderful things happen to me lately in my practice. I had, uh, there's a high school uh, near my practice where there's a lot of uh, really good, it's got a really good jazz program. And I'm getting high school kids coming to see me after they go to the big, the big box orthopedic hospital, right, who tells them what they told you and it didn't work, right? So there's enough musicians around that I've treated that they tell other people, man, go check this guy out, you know, this is, really, he's written a book, blah, 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 blah. The point is, I'm getting young musicians coming in to see me, percussionists mainly, who are having pain in their arms, and they go to the doctor, and the doctor says, yeah, well, you might have to stop playing, you may have to start thinking about a new major. And these kids have everything going for them. They live in an affluent suburb. Their parents take care of their bills and encourage them in these careers. How great would that be, right? To have your mom and dad paying for your lessons, paying for your therapy, and driving you to practice, saying, yeah, you're going to be a star. You're going to be a great drummer. That's what we want for you. How fantastic is that, right? So these guys have it all going for them. And when they come see me, I tell them what they need to do, and I, I stagger it. Uh, usually it's more about, I do what I do, and they get better despite the fact that they don't do what I tell them, but the medicine is pretty powerful <laughs> stuff, right? And so what they're doing is I'm like, okay, man, you need to do this. I want you to practice 10 minutes a day for the next three days. I don't want you to do any of these. I want you to do these. Then we're going to ramp it up. You're going to come see me next week. And I do this treatment and I work. And over a period of several weeks, a couple times a week, the first couple weeks, then once a week thereafter, they're doing what I tell them. And they're taking breaks. And they're up to about a 50-minute, 5-0, I find is sort of the magic time for practice, just like a classroom, right? I find if you make it up to about 55 minutes of practice, you should then take a 10-minute break. 
I think if you go over that, you don't need to. There's no reason not to stop for 10 minutes and just get up and take a walk and shake it out or, or whatever it is that you want to do, okay? But I find that to be the magic number. And now um, I've got these guys playing at, at peak strength and then one guy just got a scholarship to new school. So um, really cool stuff going on. So. Um, I think taking a break and a breath is really important. I think it's real easy to get carried away and worked up and not stop and just take a break and it'll help. And it may be the thing that keeps these problems from coming or from continuing as it were. So uh, always remember to do that too. Uh, so stretch and warm up, not bunk. I say that because just like studies every week tell you about how great wine and coffee and chocolate are for you and then take it away the next week. Um, there are studies now that say that, and from, from reputable sources, stretching and warming up are not necessary. In fact, they may hurt you, okay? Um, I think these need to be read carefully and taken with a grain of salt. And there's no reason in the world why stretching would not be a good thing or warming up would not be a good thing. Get the blood flowing rather than just go into that run without stretching a little bit or that sprint or whatever. Same thing here, okay? So this particular stretch I want to show you, the traditional musician stretch is this, right? That's what everybody does, okay? I don't like that at all. And the reason is there's no control. It's just grab and pull and maybe it'll do something, okay? This stretch that I've developed takes care of problems in the hand and the wrist and the forearm and may help you with yours, okay? And this is how you do it. Um, you find a flat, you can always do this on the desktop if you want to. Um, you find a flat surface, that's going to be a good one. And you take your arm and put your elbow like that. Now your hand here may go back this far or it may go back this far. You're not trying to make it go back any further than it naturally will by you putting your elbow on the table, okay? So wherever it stops, that's cool. As you have more flexibility and as this works more, it'll go back further. That's cool too, whatever, okay? So, you're going to take this other hand and you then grasp right where the fingers meet the palm. Now, when I say grasp, you're making a contact. You're not clenching, you're not pulling, you're not gripping. You just got a contact right there, okay? The right arm now will descend by the elbow. So, the elbow is the fulcrum, as it were, but it's not pulling. It's just right arm's coming down now. That is going to pull the hand and wrist into this position here. You notice my elbow is not hitting the table. It's not trying to hit the table. It's in space. It's not pulling. It's not causing any distress here. I should be feeling a nice stretch right about there. One that is not particularly uncomfortable. If it is, you might want to try this again and make sure you're not pulling or there isn't unnecessary heaviness or tension in your shoulder. Okay? Are you saying gravity? In essence, you're using the gravity of your pulling hand? Ah, uh, yeah. You're like, yeah, gravity's taking over. You're simply making the contact yeah. and then gravity will bring your arm down and then you just let it hang. Right? <laughs> Got it? Okay. Do that for 30 to 60 seconds before and after playing or when it's bothering you. You could do it in the morning and the night if you like, you know, okay? Um, then you go do the thumb independently. Same thing, separate stretch. Make that contact. Okay, we got that, yeah? Same thing, contact, let it hang down. It's going to go off in that direction. That's what it's supposed to do. If you double joint it, it may go a little further. Okay, no worries. Let it hang. Same kind of thing. That handles the whole hand, right? 
and then you can shake it out if you want to, but, and then you go do the other side. Not too much, none of this is supposed to be tense or a problem or really, uh, you're you really laying into it or anything, just, okay, I know that I've saved a lot of musicians' careers with this whether it was they were going to have surgery or they couldn't play or whatever it is. I mean, people come up to me at conventions and tell me this all the time, which is, which is really cool. But this is far superior to this kind of thing. Because this is control. If I'm pulling to, wow, that hurts. Maybe I'm not, oh, yeah, lighten up. Okay. Well, it still hurts. Oh, maybe the, yeah, I'm pulling. Okay. So what uh, does pain mean? Pain is a positive thing. It tells you something's wrong and you need to fix it before it becomes a serious problem. Or it is a serious problem and needs to be addressed immediately uh, before further complications set in. That's what pain is. You mean how is it generated? Well, not, uh, so like say you do this and all of a sudden there's something that's, that, that's painful. So yeah. then, then what's the... The feedback from that. Okay, so you, again, you make sure that my, my assessment of this is, first of all, am <coughs> I forcing the hand back or am I letting it loose? Is everything in a relaxed state? Then, if all is good with this arm, am I clasping or am I just making that contact? Okay, so no, so I, I'm not asking it about as a matter of technique. Okay, so you're you've done doing it. Like, so like, so I'm doing this, and if I do this, and I say, okay, my right thumb is now sore. Okay. So what does that what what does that mean now? What is that? What's the next step? What's the what's okay. the, the so message or what's the feedback the, to be? The, the message is if I think that I've done this properly and yeah. I am having pain in an area, that it is not likely to be something that is a tightness in the muscle or a nerve issue and it's probably more of a bony arthritic issue and something that needs to be handled uh, by a physician or by a therapist uh, because this a muscular tension uh, slash nerve injury in this area should be handled by this. That's, that's, okay. yeah, that's it. Did everybody do that? Did it feel okay? No. Do it, do it, do it a couple times a day. It'll help, okay? Um, so there's that. Stretching and warming up, I, I think, is a no-brainer. You know, if you, don't, if, if you don't think it's necessary, okay, maybe it isn't. But to tell somebody that they shouldn't do it makes no sense to me. We've got about 15 minutes left. Okay, so my last slide. All is one. <laughs> That means click to add text when in doubt. No, uh, that, that means um, the stuff that we're talking about isn't just for practice time. It's for everything. It's for walking down the street. It's this postural thing that we talked about, This that, that reference, that string. It isn't just, oh, I'm going to play now. Let me get my thing together. It may be more of a concern then because you're approaching the instrument. It's more of a reference point for that because that's what we're here and that's what we're talking about. But this stuff will serve you well throughout life and uh, hopefully for you it becomes all one big great thing, which it has for me. My work and my play and my livelihood and all of it is just one big really great existence and I hope that's the same for you. And part of it is because I'm not delineating how I'm going to do things at certain times. I just conduct myself posturally or whatever in the same manner all the time it's a nice way to live that's it okay cool Great. so let's uh let's see uh anybody want to play sure yeah i'm not sure like the time to go to make tired okay you can either demonstrate something that would be a problem or you can just go ahead and start playing and i can observe right oh yeah i'll play i mean usually this would the the, the fatigue would come in after an extended period of time like after like Doing a set like forty-five minutes of playing. Okay. Like, but like, uh, if I'm playing like, um, you know, just play. It. Do you look at the back a lot? I said no. I said I looked at right here. Okay. Thank you.
So let's say you played that 45 minutes set. Where is the pain? The pain is it's not pain. Okay, it's, where's the it's fatigue. Fatigue, right here. Okay, right there. So okay. it's this, it's this hand. It's all like a And then so if I'm playing a walking bass line, let's say for instance, you know, like a Balances kind of yeah, like you, that, like you do that, that. right? Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, so and part of this approach thing that I talked about is you might want to start by just thinking about that strain, just relaxing these muscles and, and letting those shoulders drop. And it's not even so much that I'm concerned about what you may be doing wrong or not, and I'm thinking it's more an issue of the thumb pressure on the back of okay. the neck. Um, which you may or may not be aware of, and I may or may not be aware of, but with high action, that's likely to be uh, yeah. something that may happen, um, and, and is a very common thing that may happen. By sort of doing the survey before you start playing, you are more likely to start out in a relaxed way, rather than in a way that some muscles are already tight and compromised, and you're going into it like that. And I'm not sure if that is the case with you or not, but it's something to keep in mind, right? Mm -hmm. There's a really cool interview with uh, Gary Peacock about how he sort of becomes one with the instrument before he plays it. He stops and he, and he thinks about the instrument and how he's going to perform, and he becomes one with it, and you know, thank you, tree, for giving me the wood, and all that kind of thing. Not, not really, but you know what I mean. It's a, he, he stops and he becomes one with his instrument, which is, is a valid point, and that's his approach, and it seems to work, uh, given his history as well. But I would say there was not, I didn't see uh, a, a bad wrist angle or any extraneous use of the, the limbs or any really bad posture or anything that you were doing that gave me a lot of cause for concern, or I could say, turn your foot in this way, or anything immediate, but I think it's probably the act, if you could stand to lower the action a little bit, that might be a useful thing to you. Maybe you want to, maybe you don't, maybe in five years you decide it's time to lower the action. Who knows, right? Um, but problems in this area specifically are usually going to be because of the thumb pressure, and I didn't see your angle because of the way you were holding the bass, your wrist angle being all that bad. So I'm thinking it's thumb pressure, which you may or may not be aware of, and you play with your action a little high so you can play in a more aggressive style, it appears, and that's going to lend itself to that thumb. And just by virtue of where does it hurt, that would be it. Does that go up into your uh, into your forearm enough? No. Yes, sir. No, I'm just curious, because I, Tommy, you have a really narrow neck. Yeah. Have you ever played a bass with yeah. a, a wider, My other bass deeper is a neck? Is a Do you, does your hand fatigue in the same way? It's hard to say because my other, like that's the one I tend to use more. So if I'm doing something where, if I'm doing like a country gig where it's not really, I'll use my other bass. But for anything where it's going to be demanding, where I have to play really densely for an hour at a time, I'll go use that bass. Yeah, I'm just you know. saying that I know from my own playing, uh, my own hand to sustain power with a platform like that is much more fatiguing than if I can have a more open hand position. Right, yeah, yeah, maybe, right? Yeah. It's such a small neck, yeah. yeah. You know, there's something... Yeah, that's a good point. There's something, you know, I don't know if you saw that bass I have with that can't made that prosthesis, that's that mm -hmm. made, it, made a thing that just... Oh, yeah, I didn't see it, yeah. But yeah. actually really yeah. made that much more comfortable. Someone thinned out the neck too much, mm -hmm. and it was just such a drag to play, and that really changed it because it, fe it feels to me like it's like it's a cumulative 
um, misuse of energy that's ultimately making muscles tired, yeah. more so than something that's hurting me. So maybe that would be a thin neck. Yeah, and, and that would make sense too, because on the electric bass, guys who play more aggressively tend to like a big, more of a baseball bat P style neck rather yeah. than a more elegant jazz bass neck where guys usually have the, the action lower so they can play faster. So that that's a really great point and one that I didn't think about. I um, mean, you seem to be playing with the uh, the old traditional keep the thumb behind the, like sort of in the middle of the second and third finger pyramid kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So from, depend, from watching you and from what you told me, uh, and from and your style of playing, I think that's what it is. Okay. You can either be more aware of, hey, I don't need to death grip with the thumb, uh, or just in between songs, I don't know if you do this, or I don't know what you do in between songs, but if you take the time to just shake it out on yeah. the bass like that, and again, you can do wrist, it's not complicated, right? It's one way, then the other way, then one of these. Yeah. Even the minute of break of that yeah. not being on there, or whatever it may be, that's important, and that would probably help you without you having to change your style. Right, because it doesn't happen when I play notated music. Okay, it's only when I'm playing because notated music, I'm I'm gesturally right. Know, everything's worked out. Yeah, but, right. But Perfect. When I'm playing like Perfect. that. All of a sudden, this is bizarre fatigue. Where right, like, that's your that's yeah. your thing, which you were just showing us. So I think that's exactly what okay. it is. So you can try shaking that out. You could go get therapy for it, but you could probably by not. Uh, by being mindful of the pressure of yeah. the thumb and by shaking it out. And if you so choose to lower your action now or at some point, that may be helpful too. Right. That's what I would do. Otherwise, it looked really good to me. Okay, thanks. Cool. Cool, oh, thank you. Sure. Just put it down here. Yeah, just put it in there. Anybody else? Sure, I actually have a similar question. Well, okay. Because I have this like crazy double joint. You sure do. And <laughs> oh, that's a lot of big, that's so much cool. Did you see his thumb? Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah, envy of many yeah, a basis, right? Well, but so what, what happens is I actually can't maintain the normal like straight thumb thing, so my thumb end always ends up kind of doing this. Okay. But it, I don't. You've been in the same place? No. Okay. Um, so the, the I'm just wondering if it's potentially a bad thing. Oh no, there's nothing you can do about that. Okay. You're double jointed. You're double jointed. Um, I don't. If anything, there's some like tension that comes in there, but it's still free to move and it's not painful. You're not going to have pain in the same place. You're mm -hmm. going to have pain at that particular right joint. Okay. Yeah. And the thing is, at a joint, the joint is where two bones come together right. and there's cartilage in between to keep the bones from hitting each other. So you are going to have the issue of that cartilage being compromised from Here. common, yeah, Here. from the bones being sort of smashed together. Mm -hmm. So how old are you? 26. Okay, so when you start to hit about 30, mm -hmm. your joints, the cartilage in your discs and in your joints starts to degenerate because the hydration that is built in to them doesn't stay. It starts to evaporate. It starts to dehydrate. And there's not enough of a consequent blood supply there to handle it. So you're talking more of an arthritic thing there. Okay. The sort of remedy for that is the same thing. So you don't have to worry about that now, but you will have to. Okay. Um, if you, the sooner you avail yourself of a lighter touch, you're not going to be able to change anything about your position because you you'd have to go like that, and that's that's not going to yes. be good for you. Okay. So the awareness for you is of these bones mm -hmm. coming together, that cartilage degenerating, and then an arthritic problem, and then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So by following the same strategy, that will help you to have to uh, not have these issues in future. Um, but you're good. You're you're right to be concerned about it now because if you're able to sort of adapt now, and not a whole lot. I'm not mm -hmm. asking you to change really that much mm -hmm. at all. That will that will so help to see. What, what should I change? Or it's it's simply pressure. Okay. I was talking okay. to your okay. colleague yeah. Yeah. about okay. having right. the pain there, okay. but you're going to yeah. have it here because of that enormous base thumb right. here. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I mean, so a pressure in what sense? So instead of squeezing. Yeah. So then yeah. then coming from from your back and falling down, falling on top of the instrument with weight. No, it's strictly this thumb. And this muscle 
here yeah. on the back of the right. neck, just like death gripping it. Yeah. So the more you can yeah. use weight coming down from your arm. And especially as a double jointed, right. as, as it being double jointed, it's going to be even have more pressure applied to it in order to take pressure off of the rest of the hand and the wrist. But that's a common trigger for performance, and you mentioned something about performance anxiety before. That's a common. Oh, I mean that's just in a trope in um, the right. Book. You were talking about the book, yeah. but I'm referring to to that in the respect that a lot of people, man, I'm going to play right now for this class, and okay, and I, every every muscle in my body is tight, and I'm gripping this instrument because right now this is what I, what's going to get me through this or not, and I'm. I've got it. I want to be secure with it, right? So something to keep in mind. Okay. But yeah, same strategy, but for a different reason. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Everything else is pretty good to me. Okay. You obviously have a great teacher. <laughs> 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 anybody else? Anybody else? Anything? You want to play? Maybe you want to ask questions? Yeah, sure. It's, yeah. So I'm good. Josh, you should, if anyone can get involved with that, would Please take advantage of this opportunity. The thing about the breathing too, um, again, you, you all have different needs for your breathing according to your instrumentation perhaps, but if you, if the deep breathing thing is a necessity, if you just get that under your belt, then you can tone it down rather than worrying about having to ramp it up and that's a whole lot easier. And it's better for you in the long run. Okay. Um, Is there any issues that you want to talk about first? Uh, that you I have the same thing. Okay. And um, yeah. before I had a flute that was offset. So that means that these keys uh -huh. were a little bit, oh. were not in the same line that we're standing here. Okay. And the drill key was longer. Okay. So there is offset and inline. And uh -huh. since I changed to inline, that I had a problem when the keys were here mm -hmm. that I couldn't drill mm -hmm. and during a performance my finger just stopped moving. Ah, okay. But now as soon as I play inline, no problem anymore. Great. That's, but it's so it's not a problem anymore. Good, good. <laughs> what happens to a lot of perform a lot a lot of people, um, and sometimes it can be explained by something like that, and sometimes it just sort of happens. There's a repetitive uh, stress type injury. Uh, that manifests as a trigger finger, right? Where the finger stutters. Like if you, uh, you'll notice your finger gets stuck, right? It's usually the middle or the, uh, or the ring, but it could be other fingers. And it'll, you'll be playing and you'll be doing some activity and the finger won't bend properly. It'll get stuck, mm. literally. And sometimes you have to give it one of these to get it back to where it needs to be. And the, how you know you have that is if you make a fist, and you open it and one leg does it open or lags behind, then you've got this trigger finger, which is an inflammation of tendon sheaths, which is, we talked about tendons connecting muscle to bone, and the sheaths sort of surround that, as the name would suggest. And when those become inflamed, and this would be a good candidate for something like mm -hmm. that, then that becomes an issue. Uh, so I'm glad that, that, that you, were, yeah. you, you made that decision because it wasn't working for you, right? And you're happy with Actually, this? yeah, no, I, was, I wasn't aware of that. I just bought a better flute because I really liked the flute. Okay. And it was like, oh, now I have to change my, my system because I played for, yeah, I don't know, 15 years uh -huh. like this. Yeah. And then I saw that flute and I was like, yeah, oh, I really like this flute. I will have to change the system. And actually, then I realized, like, huh, this helps. Uh -huh. cool. <laughs> but I wasn't aware of it. Great, before, great. So. Yeah, happy, happy circumstance. Yeah, shall I play or? Sure, please. Um, do you sit when you play a lot? If I, if I if I practice, I sit, and when I perform, I prefer standing. Okay. Um, is there a reason you prefer, or you just sit and you you do one or the other? Just uh, because you're practicing, it's more comfortable. Yeah, and okay. energy wise. Okay. Not to give too no, much you energy. never practice like standing, right? No. Me too. I mean, I, I, yeah. It's no. <laughs> okay, I never thought about it. <laughs> yeah, same stuff. Um. <laughs> I think it's more important. I, I know I keep interrupting you. But I think that standing, sitting is more important for an instrument that has to sit on the body in a certain way. That could be the upright, that could be the guitar, but in a way in which 
you have to play a whole lot different in, if you change your position. In this, it seems like you would sit, we might be talking about back issues, but yeah, I mean, essentially, same. this is all the same deal from the waist up, I would yeah. imagine. Right, okay, so please. Um. Or a different type with is more uh, energetic. Um. So it, I don't know if you can see that or not. I was always wondering: Do I have another posture or position when I play soft music than when I play more energetic music? Okay, what answer? Do it again. I'd have to. See yeah, I, I I have an idea. Sure. And the sentiment, the emotion, right? What's brought forth by the, the music, sure. Because what, it, what a lot of teachers always, I, I have the emotion shoulder. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 when it get, when it gets. Um, well, that was a tongue ram, right? In the second, the popping. Uh, no, pizzicato. Oh, is, that that Chethro, okay. is that Jethro Tull's second album? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, that's a typical. Uh, that's a, I have it's the wrong yeah, technique, but. So you call it pizzicato, but I know from from this angle, it looks like your your neck is more craned forward to do that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I agree with all this. I also say I watch her do this and then come back to a practical sort of a neutral position. So I'm I I think that's great because the the problem with a lot of uh, instrumentalists who may this, and there's nothing wrong with uh, expressing emotion in your music, but the problem is, is if you get so wrapped up in it and you don't come back from mm. it, right? You just continue or you, you don't come back to a responsible place. It seems like when you're doing your thing, you're coming back. Yeah. And, you're, and, and that's really what the thrust of all this has been about. I, I hope that that wasn't missed, is that there's certain things that you can do to alter what you're doing. But if you come back to a place, a neutral sort of a position that's going to allow you to, and your body to not get caught up in that position or posture and, and give you a, a proper break from it, even for that moment, the body won't get used to it and absorb it as what it's supposed to be like and you won't get trapped into that posture. So I, I thought that was great. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because there was this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank you. Yeah. We, we are five minutes over time. So, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, what do, you, what do you want to do? We can say thank you. If someone really wants to play, I can, you know, this is a moment. But um, let me give you my, uh, my email. Uh, it's okay. D, it's D-R-K-E-R-T-Z at A-O-L. My website, www.drkertz.com. So it's Dr. Kurtz. You can yeah, get it from Mark anytime as well. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll give it to you. Yeah. Uh, I could write it down. Or, but it, yeah. Yeah. It's Kurtz. Dr. Kurtz. And uh, Randy, thank you so, so much. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.